Welcome to the Keen Run Yoga podcast, bringing you the stories of many people who in various ways are attempting to walk the path of yoga. Our intention is to inspire your own practice and commitment to yoga beyond the mat and in all areas of life. We consider this an offering, a service to the community and labour of love. If you feel inclined, any donations are appreciated, just visit our page and click the donate button at www.keenonyoga.co.uk forward slash podcast. I hope you enjoy the show. Yuval Eilon is a professional gymnast and was a member of the Israeli national gymnastics team. He started training at the age of eight. In his early 30s, he retired from professional gymnastics and after trying his hand at corporate life, decided to put his skills to use as a circus performer. Having been turned down on audition by Cirque du Soleil, not for his gymnastic ability, even though he was unusually old for the audition at this time, but for his dance skills, he spent some time practicing these on the streets of Tel Aviv as a street performer and artist. He finally landed a job with The Rev, a circus act based in Las Vegas, moving there with his family and performing in the show with his wife for the last eight years. More recently, by popular request, after retiring from um, circus performing, he started to teach the art of hand balancing and handstands around the world and has been teaching until recently an average of one workshop a week, bringing many different cultures and languages together in the art of handstands. Welcome Yuval to the Keenon Yoga podcast. Okay, um, so welcome, welcome Yuval. Um, how, did you, how did you get into gymnastics in the first place? Um, well, I, I started as a, as a kid, uh, you know, hyperactive, very physical kid. Uh, my parents uh, took me to gymnastics and tennis. Uh, I did for a year, I did both. Uh, and then I, I naturally chose, uh, I chose gymnastics, fell in love with the sport uh, as a kid. And then just... How old, how old were you? Uh, eight. Eight, right. Yeah, I tried earlier when I was six, but uh, I didn't have the attention. Right, uh, right. I, you know, I, I couldn't concentrate. And then when I was eight, uh, it was easier for me to, uh, to receive the, you know, the coaching and everything. And, and then from there on, I, it just happened by itself. I, I really uh, enjoyed the, the sport itself, the learning of skills, the acrobatic part of it. It's like a, a playground for, for, you know, uh, yeah. for kids, you know, learning how to sound your hands, to flip, to, uh, to do things that you see uh, the, the Olympic champions doing. You know, these were my, my idols as a kid, you know. Did you, did you carry on with it? Uh, yeah, continued to be quite disciplined at that point. When you from when you were eight, you continued. You just kind of yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I, yeah. I wasn't forced into it. It was very natural. I I, I loved uh, doing it. I loved the hard work, the and the process, uh, and then later on, starting to um, compete uh, from from a young age. You start with the low levels until you reach national level. Um, and then um, I reached, and when I was 18, I, I joined the army in Israel. Everybody joins the army. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I, but I served as a, uh, in a special unit that, uh, uh, for athletes. Oh, so, really? Yeah, so uh, competitive athletes in general in Israel, right. uh, those who reach international level are exempt from uh, combat units. So they, they are stationed close to their gym and, you know, they still do some work, usually not physical. Um, and, and then it allows you to continue uh, to practice and compete during, during these three years. So, so that was... Uh, Definitely um, one benefit of, of gymnastics. Maybe yeah. an easy, ar- easy army service anyway. But. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. it wasn't, you know, it wasn't about easy, it's about... about continuing to do something that yeah, you spent yeah. all your life doing and, and building mm-hmm. and not stopping, you know, like three years in this level, yeah, it's right. the end mm-hmm. of your career. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then uh, one, once I finished, I, you know, during that time, I was already competing for Israel and European and uh, world championships. And, um, and then when I, when I, towards the end of my uh, army service, I, I applied to uh, an American university uh, and received a, a full scholarship, uh, sports scholarship 
Uh, mm-hmm. There is the NCAA League in the U.S., if you're familiar, uh, for various sports. And uh, right. I, I represented the university for four years and then received uh, the education and had to study student athletes, basically. Um, and then What did once you study? I, I studied uh, communications, right. marketing, nothing right. to do. Retrospectively, right. maybe I should have gone somewhere else, but you know, this is life yeah. and I, I made a decision then. I, um, I just wanted to say, when you, when you first got into gymnastics, were you yeah. good from the start? I mean, because I tried it when I was a kid and I was rubbish, so I just quit. But were you uh, good, you know, therefore you carried I, I, on? I, I, I was good. I was, I was good from young age, but I wasn't right. a natural. So I was a hard worker. Really? Yeah, right. I, I was I was a hard worker. I always needed right. to. Uh, it was easy for me to work hard. It was just part of my my personality to put the hours, to do the repetitions. Um, yeah, from, from young age. Yeah, I mean, right. especially in a competitive sport, mm-hmm. you you understand as a kid early on the value of preparation for of, of you know learning a skill, performing it under pressure. So, so there, there is, uh, yeah, very, very early on, you, you learn how to visualize your routine and go to a competition and, and put your fears aside and, and try to do the best you can to, to perform. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. G- gymnastics in that way, you know, it's, it's competitive, but your biggest competitor is yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you're alone inside a bubble when you compete. Mm. Uh, you're not, it's not a face-to-face uh, combat or, or uh, you know, tennis or, you know, where, where you are competing against another person. You, you are in your body and you're responsible for your routine and whatever happens in the routine is, is you. Yeah. I, I mean, on that, just as a slight diversion, maybe, you know, it strikes me, how, how do you deal with nerves then or fear? Like, Or even disappointment at yourself, like how does the whole psychology of it work? you know after you finish maybe you had a bad show or even before you have anticipatory nerves, I used to get them a lot um yeah yeah yeah, you know, doing uh, yoga demos you know i think I think um as a kid, it's usually i mean back in the day we didn't work with psychologists today it's much more common uh athletes from very young age work with the psychologist to deal with this these issues. Of fear and how to compete and how to reduce the stress levels um, back in the day it was more the job of the coach to do it and then and also uh, each each I think person developed their own mechanism uh, coping mechanisms um, with with the situation and I remember you know like looking back I was basically learning how to meditate learning how to you know 10 year old, visualizing mm-hmm. their closing their eyes and, and I visualized my routine 10 times in a positive way mm-hmm. you know in order yeah. and then and then you go to the competition and and then you have to you know you take a breath and then you a deep breath and then you go and do the routine sometimes you hit it sometimes you don't if you don't you go back to practice and 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 work on the problem areas you know so it's like a performance or you know um, It's a, the sport is, yeah, like any sport in that way. Mm-hmm. So once you were in it, you didn't feel nervous anymore? No, you always feel nervous. Yeah. Right. Oh, really? it, depending, it, depend, it depends also on the, on the context, the competition. Like, for example, uh, in, the, um, in the university, I was on a full ride because I was an all-around um, athlete. I did all six events. And the expectations are high as well. So, of course, it's put some pressure. You don't want to um, mess up in competition and then uh, disappoint your teammates or you want mm. to lead them. So you need to show an example, for example. Um, so, yeah, the, the stress is always there. The best way to cope with stress is preparation. Uh, right. Mm-hmm. The better preparation you have, And, uh, and looking back in my career, those competitions that, that I did well, the, the, going into the competition the month before, you could, I could see the, how, how, you know, the, the, the percentage I hit in practice was high. Mm-hmm. And then in, in competition, in, in, in the leading to a competition where you're, in, you're falling, you're injured, you have doubts on yourself, 
usually it shows in the competition. It's very hard to, uh, you know, to make the magic, magic happen if, if you continuously mess up just kind of winging it in, in your in your in your practice but uh yeah it, it's i think it's something that every um every gymnast every athlete goes through and like i said before develop their own uh coping mechanisms and and routines and what works for you some people meditate in certain ways some people listen to music some people you know it's very different from right. from athlete to athlete and um and you find your own way yeah so you just then, found your own way. I mean, it goes to a question I was going to ask later. Have you start? Have you kind of attempted doing any more formal meditation or anything else? You know, um, you just kind you, of no. Your way I mean, I, I did. I did. I remember reading some text uh, of uh, like some Chinese philosophy. Um, you know, the Tao of the athlete yeah. of uh, stuff like yeah. that. Back uh, yeah. you know when I was fourteen, yeah. fifteen, yeah. which was interesting. Uh, you know, feel it and, you know, don't do anything, just let it, you know, but, but it's uh, very basic, you know, stuff. Um, and, and then during, uh, interesting, that's where yoga comes into, into the picture. Uh, during my junior year in college, I went to school in, in the University of Illinois in, at Urbana-Champaign, the middle of America. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I, and I, you know, I, I found that it was 1996. So it, it was before, I think the yoga has become like the explosion that you, For sure, where, yeah. where it is today. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, in, in my, in my uh, college time, there was one yoga studio uh, that happened to be an Iyengar, a traditional Iyengar yoga studio. And uh, the woman who, who owned the place, who runs the place, uh, Lois Steinberg, uh, she she's at the time she's already been going to Pune for 25 years. She was like uh, Iyengar's student. She wrote a lot in the yoga junas for him. And and, and I, uh, I I went out of interest. And and while I was still uh, a, a competitive athlete, I I started taking uh, a weekly class on on my day off. I took a Saturday morning uh, class which was extremely interesting and very challenging. And uh, I was very interesting also to try to see uh, where is the, the parallels, where, right. what, what can mm. I take from yoga, from the system itself, uh, which is vast, uh, into my specific activity, whether it's um, uh, um, mentally or physically. You know, and in the Yangar, there's also a lot of focus on alignment, which I found interesting. And I and I try to find, okay, where, you know, from what I take in this class, where I can put it in my handstand or in my, or other mm-hmm. skills mm-hmm. that I was doing. Um, so and what so did that, 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 how did that look like? I mean, what, what parallels <laughs> did you find? Yeah, yeah, it was more an experimentation. And, and looking back, I wasn't, it was, I'm not, I don't have any, uh, um, you know, I don't know if, if going into, uh, into yoga while still competitive athlete is a good idea, especially in the end of the career, because by then your body is so uh, accustomed to a certain way to do things, to trying to do different uh, you know, different lingo and different, it could be confusing. Mm, so, mm. so it was, it was, it was more, you know, I, I, I took it, it was an experience. I, I, it opened up the doors to this whole world. Um, and then, uh, I, I was, I think for a year, a year and a half, I was, uh, I was still uh, going to, to this class once a week or every two weeks, depending on competitions. Um, and then I, and then it was the, when I finished my, my last year of college, I had a back injury. Uh, I was able to, to, I had a herniated disc, lower back, uh, and, uh, or bulging disc. It was just Mm. not not very uh, pleasant. And, Mm. um, by the end of the season, I was able to finish the season somehow, not at my best. I decided to, that it, that, that I won't be able to continue uh, and go for the, the Olympics back. It was the 2000 Olympics that I was, you know, that was my childhood dream. You know, that right. was my, what would, from the, from very young age, that was the, 
the mountain. You know, I want to move right. there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but it, but I came to a realization. I finished my last competition, and I knew it was over. How old were you? Uh, I was twenty six. Okay. Yeah, twenty six. My mm-hmm. body was not feeling good, and I, and and then I I I I just decided to retire, and and try to figure out what I want to do with my life. It was my first, you know, it was my first uh, retirement at the age of 26 after uh, your whole life is yeah, yeah, just yeah. that. That's your, yeah, that's your yeah. identity. Mm, yeah. That must have been crazy. I mean, at that time, like what? Yeah, it's very, it's very, yeah, it's yeah. a very difficult, uh, yeah, it's a very difficult sure. moment. Yeah, because also really you, asked, I mean, yeah. I was also going to ask, I mean, you must have been left with a whole bunch of time because I've been mean, previously, you were training competitively. How many hours a day would that be? I mean, yeah, I mean day, you right? know, I, I, in the, in the end of my 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 college career, so it was I was dividing the time between gymnastics and school. So usually the the practice was in the afternoon, uh, you know, four hours in the afternoon, more or less, three to seven. That was the 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 time we trained, um, and then the rest I was a student. Um, so it wasn't like a fully professional athlete before I was training a little bit more. Um, but you know, it, it was, uh, it was still, it was the, a big part of, of my, uh, uh, of my life, my identity, mm. who I am. Mm. Mm. I, no, I had no questions. I knew, you know, you wake up, you go to practice, mm. you enjoy what you mm. do. And, and, um, and then, and then I, I retired and I had to figure out how to channel my energies into something else. And, and it took me a, quite a long time. Uh, I didn't want to do, I, I didn't want to be a, a coach or a teacher. It didn't interest me because I, I love doing it. I didn't want to be on the other side. Uh, and so, so I, you know, I, I used my degree. I thought, okay, I'm going to try marketing and, mm. uh, and communications. And, and I tried, uh, you know, the corporate you world for you did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I tried it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I tried. I was stubborn. I tried for like two, three years. Right. And I didn't didn't go well, you know. Mm. I was very me- mediocre, and and in, in, in what I was doing, it wasn't my natural uh, environment. So I said, okay, I, I took a break. Uh, I, I returned to Israel, and uh, um, to go for for a trip in the Far East, I went to India. Decided to go to India. Usually, uh, Israelis do it after the army when they're twenty one. Yeah. I it took me uh, nine years later even more. Uh, yeah, about 10 years later. Uh, India for uh, seven months, uh, you know, trying different things. I actually, in the beginning of my trip, I, I met Lois, my yoga teacher in Pune. She, she happened to be there in training. So she like, I went there and she, come on, come on, meet the younger. So, so I went and meet the younger, come on, do, do a handstand for him. And I was like, oh boy. So I did a handstand and he was standing there near his, the, the and he nodded. That's that's my Iyengar story, <laughs> you know. So, so I presented I presented my pre uh, handstand days. Uh, yeah, handstand yeah. to Iyengar. To Iyengar. Yeah. Well, that's that's quite a claim. But we, so during the time you were going to the office, you were still training on your own or still practicing. Yeah, but I was I was kind of like I was jogging. I was doing some handstands. I was doing this. You know, it, it wasn't um, in India. You know, I tr- I tried different yoga classes and and meditation and you know and I just traveled there and I, it was time for me to kind of wind down and okay to figure out uh, and I came back and I didn't have any answers but uh, but the big the big um, change after this uh, trip to India was that I did not go back to the old patterns I did not go back to the office uh, I started uh, you know I, I opened a class, acrobatic class for non-athletes and I started teaching acrobatics and I, I met some uh, circus group in Tel Aviv and I started performing and teaching in the circus school. And, you know, so uh, I took, a, I, I got, a, um, I did a massage course and I started working as a massage therapist and I started exploring body work as well. Um, and, and from there on, things kind of like right. happened mm. much more naturally. Mm-hmm. Uh, which led me to handstand, to start exploring handstand in a more serious way, as well as uh, maybe going uh, going for a circus career. 
Uh, but you've been doing handstands time. before, so I, I kind of yeah, I, I was, I was on another I was podcast, doing, but it was different, right? Like yeah, I was, I was doing, doing a handstand. Movement. Yeah, I was doing handstand as a gymnast, which mm. is you know a good handstand is a good handstand, but there is the handstand is not is is a is a tool to do other skills in gymnastics. You don't do hold it for more than two seconds, right? Okay. And and hand balancing is is uh, different. It's it's a acrobatic discipline from the same family, but different. You is know, it? The, the, yeah, it, it's the goal is you know to hold much longer periods of time on one arm and to you know um, it's the specialization in one little part of gymnastics. So so basically, I'm I'm, I'm specializing in one little skill that's mm. a very tiny part, an important part, but mm. a tiny part of gymnastics. Um, mm. I, it started out of interest, teaching acrobatics, you teach handstand. And then since I, I'm, I'm suddenly teaching, I'm a teacher, then I, I, I said, okay, I want to, I saw these videos of these uh, circus artists doing an ama- amazing things. And, and, I, and I started experimenting on my own with with handstand different handstand positions including the one arm handstand and uh i kind of figured it out by myself not with the good you know it took me a few you know two three weeks to 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 hold the one arm handstand not, not i'm not, not bad. Uh, as, yeah. i'm not bragging about it because yeah, you know, yeah. a, a gymnast, well, you've done a lot already yeah a you've done a lot has, already let's say yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a gymnast yeah. already has the ten thousand hours on his hands when yeah. he starts so, yeah. so my starting point was different, except that I didn't know the technique, the, the specific technique that's, that's very uh, specific for handstand, for equilibre, or, you know, hand balancing. There's a kind of different vibe in it, isn't there? When you're doing gymnastics, you're doing kind of one thing, and when you're doing acrobatics and circus, it's a kind of different, kind of like whole yes. feeling around it, right? Yeah, like so, so, so as a... As a as an artist, and as mm. a circus artist, you are performing for the audience. You express you 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 express a certain emotion. Right. As a gymnast, you don't express anything. You're completely right. in your bubble, uh, uh, you know, doing your things, executing a routine. Mm. So mm. so the, the the big difference between uh, being a circus art, circus artist and a and a gymnast is is that. The communication with the audience, uh, adding feelings in, into it. Uh, that said, the circus world is also very competitive. So, if you are competing for for uh, a contract with a big company, you are competing full on. There's no. You might need to show a little bit uh, uh, theatrical skills, but you're still competing, and and, and with a skill that you develop. So, so it really, um, yeah, there's still the competition element to it, except, you know, that, that, that uh, you're not on stage you know, as a gymnast. Um, Was it hard to learn the theatrical aspect? Because, I mean, I, I think I read up to so you, you auditioned for Cirque du Soleil at a really kind of late age, you know, it's unusually kind of old, right? Because, I mean, gymnasts are young and you got through the acrobatic part, but you failed on your, what did you say, you failed on your dance skills? I, I, could, I could not, you know, I, I'm still... Terrible in learning choreography. I, right, I'm, right. A, I'm a slow learner in that sense. Once I learn it, I do it okay, I think. And uh, so, so in the audition, you know, it's like, okay, uh, we're going to learn now three counts of eight of the end of this Cirque du Soleil show uh, in front of a camera. You have, and, and, then, and then you do it as a gr- in a group and then you do it on your own. And... I just didn't have the the tools to to do yeah. it, which was mm. very very frustrating. And and then, mm. um, but you know, I so I failed the audition. I, it didn't it didn't fail. They said, okay, maybe we'll call you, maybe we won't. Um, and they didn't. Uh, but uh, but then I I heard uh, dur- when I returned, I continued to take you know dance classes and theater classes, and I continued performing and and and, and you know experiencing this world. And, um, and then I heard about another big show uh, in, in Vegas that are looking for, uh, for athletes, for, you know, uh, for circus artists, general acrobats. That's what they, how they term it. And right. uh, so they, they invited me for, I sent them a video on my demo, and they invited me for uh, an audition in Barcelona. 
and which also included uh, swimming because uh, the show that I was applying for had a, it's a water show. So you had to be able to be, to dive right. and to be comfortable right. in the water. So I was preparing, you know, I was preparing swimming every day, you know, two miles and getting into shape. And, and then, and then, you know, the artistic side was just an ongoing thing. And, and then the, the audition went amazing and I, uh, I'm amazingly well. And I, I, two weeks later, I found myself in Vegas. I was 33, uh, relatively old for a beginner in, in the circus. But uh, I, I, you know, I decided that's my one shot and I, I went for it, uh, which was amazing. Um, and between, uh, that, between that time and yeah. the time when you kind of were, were finished the gymnastics, you also did a lot of different training, didn't you? And, and I think I wanted to hear a little bit, if you don't mind me asking about the, um, the, the French master, Claude Victoria. I think yeah, you, trained with, yeah. you trained with him, didn't you? And what was, yes, I yes. Mean, he's obviously, he, you know, he, he's quite a legend, you know, amongst the circus yeah. uh, aficionados. What, what was he like? So, I mean, so, so I, I actually contact him uh, before my, uh, my audition for... For Le Rêve, the last show I I, um, I actually got into, um, I, I was looking. I you know I never I was never trained by a professional. It was all you know from the little there was on YouTube back in the day. There was no information whatsoever. You had to go to study with someone to this, this art. Um, so I googled him and I found one of his uh, students. Uh, that wrote in his website that I studied with Claude and that. And, um, and I reached out to him. I wrote a letter. I sent him some pictures and I asked, can I come to study with you? And he invited me. So I, I went, uh, it was 2004, October 2004. I, mm. I, uh, I went to study with him for one week. Mm. And, and, and in that week, uh, he basically um, gave me the template of, of the practice that I still practice until this very day. Not, you right. know, um, this is how the positions should look like. This is how you should <clears throat> practice. This is the attitude. You know, take your time, do this, how to breathe, how, you know, how to, uh, basically how to practice this discipline, which is different from gymnastics. And, and I took this week and, and continue since then uh, to develop my practice until this day. Uh, I met with him a few more times through the years. Every time I was uh, visiting France, I came for three days or four days. But, mm. but that first week really gave me, uh, after, after this week, I basically, oh, say, I, I'm, a, I'm a hand balancer. It gave right. me like, this is what yeah. I want to do. This is, this is going to be my, my circus discipline. Uh, which wasn't yeah. my discipline in the show. Right. The show, right. I, I did a few handstands, but uh, I was a general acrobat. I danced, I did aerial acrobatics or whatever they asked me to do that I could. Yeah. That was my, that fit my skills. And, and handstanding has become my, my side practice. So right. during the show, I was, you know, before and after and between the shows, I, I usually used the time, the little time I had to to continue mm. my daily repetition mm. and you mentioned the attitude that he conveyed what was what was the attitude and what was and, and what was the breathing two questions uh, the breathing of, uh, mm. so so the first thing uh, later in life he started uh, like i don't know uh, maybe when he was 50 he, he was a circus artist old school circus artist mm -hmm. started in mm. uh, when he was like 12 or 13 back in the mm. day circus family started mm. very traditional but I think when he was 50 or so, he started practicing yoga also. It was right. a very simple, I don't know, Rishikesh sequence or, you know, like eight postures. Mm. Very, you know, up or downward. Da, 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 mm. uh, shirshasana, uh, Sarvangasana, uh, Halasana. Like very, you know, uh, important but basic skills, mm. which basically include... Um, back extension forward flexion and twisting mm. you know this is the, the 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 main so he started every day like for 40 minutes going through these eight and his students did it along with him um and, and then and then we got into handstand the rest of the practice uh, three hours twice a day it was just going through the sequence with focus on 
technique and efficiency. It always, it's not so much about the reps or about the capacity or strength. There was no st- really strength training or core work or whatever. It was just handstand. You learn handstand by doing handstand, right. which is actually something I, I also, uh, this is one of the main things that I took from him. And I, I also, that's how I teach. Uh, so you so learn different handstand. ways to do the technique then. He had a particular yeah. attitude with the technique, right? Uh, he he was you know he he taught the modern Russian technique right. uh, of handstand straight handstand um, and, and, you know there's the pelvic positioning and the thoracic positioning and the shoulder positioning and where to look at and and you know th- this is what I what I got I already had a handstand so he needed like the I remember the the biggest change, the, the first time he saw me doing the handstand, he said, okay, take your head a little further up. So you look right. at the fingertips. And, and in, in gymnastics, you kind of look towards the center of your hands and it's more to take your head out a little more. So that was, okay. like, that was the first big thing. Like, oh, okay. And I had to uh, adjust my handstand and adapt to this new position. Um, and, uh, and, and then, you know, the rest, he was just, uh, I did the handstand and he corrected me, whether physically or no, 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 like this, or this is not good. This is good. This is very good to the time. And this mm-hmm. is how the week, this is how the week, uh, basically went by, you know, mm-hmm. um, a little yoga in the morning, this 40 minutes, uh, two and a half hours of handstand lunch that he cooked a little rest. He, he, liked to, after, he liked to cook, didn't he? He liked yeah, to cook I mean, and have it, a glass it, of wine. You know, you, you basically, towards the end of his uh, career, I mean, when, when I met him, he was already, he didn't t- uh, teach in a, uh, a circus school. He was mm-hmm. just teach, teaching at home. So people who came over to his place for a week or more and lived with him. So yes. three, uh, three meals a day that he prepared, very classic French uh, food, uh, and then, you know, the afternoon practice already, the second part of the practice, he was in the kitchen uh, giving you notes while he was preparing dinner. And then by the end, you, you know, you, you finish the practice, do some, uh, uh, go take a shower and then you have dinner, yeah. you know. Right. So, so it was, you know, very magical. You don't see yeah, that very yeah. happening very yeah, yeah. Uh, often today. Um, but very authentic, very, you mm, know, mm. very very interesting experience, which was I love repeating. Imp- yeah. can- was, was there any influence that it had in a quality that was other than the, you know, like did he pass on any influence that was emotional or, you know, something other than yeah, the that? Yeah, was I mean, it? you know, a lot of it, a lot of it, you know, his house was covered, uh, his walls of the house were covered by photos of, of himself and his student. Uh, very little of himself, but all of his students. Some of them were Cirque du Soleil, soloists and you know very uh, high level cir- uh, uh, circus artists and and I, I you I basically tried to imitate the technique that they, they were displaying on the wall which w- which I knew okay he was their teacher and then and then it came together with the cues that he gave me so it's very visual very you know like I, I came out of this week not uh, I didn't have a lot of theoretical information that I, that uh, he, Mm. but these little things of how to uh, position the hips and how to position the feet and how to uh, breathe, I'll get into that later, and Mm. um, uh, how to find this efficiency in order to stay for in a handstand for a minute or two or three or four, you can't do it just by developing capacity. You need to be very efficient, kind of optimization Mm. of the movement working with the skeleton uh, rather than with the muscles. And then the muscles, of course, you get strong because you, re- you repeat these patterns over and over and over. But the approach is how to make each position the lightest and the easiest constantly. So, so this is one of the things that I, uh, I got out of it. He never said this in words that I, like I'm saying now, but this is the attitude. No, no, you need to do this and relax. Don't hurry, finish. Like uh, the, the, one of the things that the signature of, of, of him and, and 
I, I would say a lot of uh, hand balancing, high level of hand balancing feature is, is a, you need to always, you know, start every set in handstand and finish the set in handstand. So, so it's not over until it's over and it's right. over in handstand. And then after you finish the last handstand, you can come down however you want. Okay, so, so it, it, it puts your, your mind mm-hmm. into this, like you need to be present and stay focused until the very last moment. Uh, and, then, and then you can come down and, 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 and then you can qualify your set as a success. Okay? So I mean, that, just, yeah, just yeah. thinking, um, we'll go back to the breathing and you'll talk about the breathing in a second, I hope. But um, I'm just thinking about the preparation. Obviously, you'd come with a great amount of strength already. Yeah. Did he, I mean, like, did he, did he give you kind of strength-based exercise to do? Nothing. Or was it... Just, I mean, because you must now, you obviously you're teaching, you know, many beginners. The, like, do you that, give them strength-based exercises? The, the, or can you just do question. a handstand? It's, it's a good question because this is something that I need to figure out on my own as a teacher later on. Because, um, because uh, you know, when I was studying with him, it was, no, just where you're learning handstand by doing handstand and I'm giving you notes. And he worked with people less uh, advanced than, uh, than me as well. And there was good results as well. It's, it's very specific. And then like, l- let's say, you know, the, the press to Hansen is always something that a lot of uh, yogis or, or people who do Hansen are, are struggling with. Uh, how do you develop the strength to do it? So one way is to do, to, to go outside the handstand and, you know, develop your core strength and compression, da, 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 da. Another way is to, to do a handstand and slowly descend, do a negative. And then during that negative, you learn what you need to strengthen and also mm. strengthen them. Mm. Uh, you also realize if you lack flexibility, what you need to work on. So it's often connected, your, your mobility and the strength come together in, in, a, in a discipline like handstand and yoga for that matter. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So, so, so this is, you know, uh, this is something that, um, you know, very typical, uh, especially if, if you go for the one arm handstand and this is uh, go back to that every set you do, you know, you, your practice basically is you have to do like 20 to 30 or 40 sets of, of one arm handstands, different variations, but, and every set starts in handstand, you go to the right, do the right arm or left, go to the center and do the left side equal both sides. Mm, mm. And then only when it, when you finish the last handstand after the, the two handstands, then you can come down and you can qualify your set as a success. You may, may have a little, you may have a little um, mistake or technical mistake. You can do better, but you know, you did your, your work. You have like, you, you have an ability to qualify if you are a practitioner, if you practice on your own, and that's how I work with my students mm, also, mm. you need to have an idea of, of okay, I'm, uh, it, whether the set was a success or a failure. If you try a skill and you fail five times, clearly it is too advanced for you at this point. Right. So you need to take a back a step, go to a, a easier variation, and then try to... Uh, um, um, reach a higher level of success, like four out of five or five out of five, and then uh, work, continue to work on, on the quality mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. what you're doing and then move to the next level and so forth. So th- this is something, yeah. again, he never said, he never gave me this something in words, yeah. but it was clear. Uh, this mm-hmm. is the method. This is the method mm-hmm. of, of, of learning such a specialized um, discipline. Which which requires high level of concentration and high level of skill and control. People seem to be really interested in the one arm handstand, particularly these days. What, yeah. what is the benefit of that, or is it just for fun? I, I you know, the the benef- There's no benefits for. I don't do it for the benefits. You don't do it right. for the actual uh, benefit of. It's not functional for anything. You can't do yeah. anything with one arm handstand, but. Uh, once you reach a certain level in uh, in two arm handstand, you master the two arm handstand. You can hold it for a minute, or upon request, to do whatever you want. Uh, you need to keep going and and going further. And and uh, the one arm handstand is a lot harder 
as a skill than uh, uh, than the two arm hands and, and requires to go through a uh, a process of learning which which is this is the big benefit the exploration that goes into the practice and and a, with a very clear goal in the end uh, right. which which I think connects also to why so many uh, yogis are interested in handstand specifically um not saying that yoga is not fun or whatever, but but sometimes it's like we need to work uh, in the West, at least the mm. way we are. We need to work with some um, some goals, attainable goals that we are working towards. You know, like when mm. you, I don't know what's your goal from practicing yoga. There are mm. different different goals for different people. Some people do it only for the physical aspect. Some people do it to to reach a different level of consciousness. Mm-hmm. You know, this, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not a yogi. I'm not, look, I'm not gonna decide mm. what, but, but I think the, the hand hand itself give, gives unlimited uh, challenges. It never ends. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and like for me, the, the difference, for example, between two arm hands and, and a one arm hands and is the, the need to, in two arm Hansen, I can think about, I can think about another thing. I can listen to a podcast and do handstand. Mm. In a one arm Hansen, I need to be present here and now. And if I'm if I go out of that, I I, I fall. Mm-hmm. If you are a circus performer, it even uh, a higher level of the game because then you need to perform in front of an audience, and you don't have the you can't mess. You, you can't fall. You're not allowed. Right. Usually. You know, so, so, did, you, did you fall in shows? And what, you know, yeah, you get I mean, you know, it's, uh, no, it's okay. You know, yeah. everybody, it, it's natural. Right. And, but, but, but as a performer, as a, as a, you, you practice so to minimize the chances of you to lose concentration and fall. Mm. Okay. To start with, all the people who, who are Cirque du Soleil performers doing Hansen, they're already in the highest level of the game. So mm. they need to maintain a certain level of, they, they already did the test early on. In order to get accepted to the, to the big show, they had to do an audition, they had to go, they performed before, they, they were familiar with the stress. But you need to still, uh, if you push the level of the skill, you need, it always puts you on the edge. Now, um, for me, I'm uh, you know I, I'm just I'm done with the performance part of my career, and 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 in the handstand, it's it's more about always trying to uh, refine what I'm doing and and learn new things. Okay, so as I, as you age, the you know the the goals that I set are more technical uh, rather than. Uh, dependent on strength that you have in your right. 20s. I, I mm-hmm. can't compete with a with a 20 year old. I, in that sense, the recuperation. But somehow it's, the, import, it's important yeah. to be challenged to continuously yeah, be to, challenged. To, right? There's something to, about to, the challenge that. Right? To you know, it's not even. A ch- it, it's to have uh, to wake up in the morning and have a reason to go to practice. You need to be right. excited about it. You need to, okay, I'm doing nice. this. Yeah. I need to, I'm not just doing these 30 reps for the sake of doing 30 reps. I'm doing these 30 reps. And every time I go on my hands, I have a very specific intention, whether it's quality, whether it's uh, breaking down a skill uh, and uh, in order to go for a more advanced skill. But you're still kind of looking somehow in the future. You never just, well, this is, this is it. This is. No, I, I don't, I don't I, you know, for, for me, I, I, I'm starting to reach this age and it's like, oh, okay, what's going to happen when I'm 60, when I'm 70? Am I going to yeah, still have yeah. the passion to continue to do it? Um, yeah. I also have been teaching now, so that it also, uh, you know, I never kind of planned to, to teach. And it happened when I finished the show. I just moved to Europe. Uh, what do I do? And people were interested. Actually, the first, uh, you might know her, the first uh, person to reach out was uh, Sofia Xitorini from, from oh, yeah. Athens. Yeah. I know yeah. her, yeah. So, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so she, right. she, saw, she saw the 40 right. set, her and Savas, her right. teacher, yeah, yeah. saw the 40 set, and like, what is it? Da, da, da. And let's reach out to him. She heard I'm in Europe, and then I, I went to Athens. 
And then I went to London, another, uh, Guillermo reached out yeah, around, the same, uh, around right. the same time and, and brought me to London. And, and then from there on, it's kind of like I, I became the, the guy who teaches Hanson in, in Europe. And, I, and it's kind of just, just I, start, I started moving around uh, Europe, Germany, a lot in Germany, uh, England, uh, Belgium, all over Western Europe, uh, right. Scandinavia. Uh, so, so, so I, I learned also uh, how to teach by teaching. Just by teaching. By teaching, by solving the problems. Okay, I, I, I knew I knew how to do a Hansen. I knew how to teach a Hansen. But how do you communicate it to a general, mm, mm. the general public? So, you know, and it changes from you know you teach a little different if you go to a yoga studio and you teach a, a bunch of advanced uh, shtangis. It's a little different than if you teach. Uh, general public like fitness people mm -hmm. it's just uh, you know so so you know how is, I, it different? is it different is it different just in terms of how you say it or do you relate to them differently i mean uh, you, like, you, you relate but also you have yourself. so so for example uh it, it, you know the big yoga in the yoga community there is the, the mobility is by, by mm -hmm. a, a lot easier to work with mm -hmm. everybody uh, the advanced practitioners They're flexible in their back. Their shoulders are open. Their hip, their hip flexor. They can, you know, they, they can go into. So I, you just focus on technique. I just give them technique, and and help them. And what's lacking maybe is a little strength, you know, joint stability, and and so as a whole, as a group. And then if you work with the CrossFit crowd, they're super strong, but some of them cannot open their shoulders to 108 degrees. So what do you do? So you have to you have to adapt to the limitations of of the audience of the of the people that you work with. So so sometimes I teach uh, the same skill a little different depending on on the limitations. And over time, of course, the goal is to to reduce the, the limitations and 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 reach the the perfect handstand, which is almost unattainable. Can, can you? Can anyone do a hands then, or is there some, you know, I mean, how much can you get I, with technique I, I and how much, how much is kind of anatomical? Can any, anybody do, yeah, look, like uh, Claude, I, I can send you a picture of, of Claude's handstand. Uh, he was, when I met him, he was like 74. Uh, he was still doing a 40 second long straight handstand. Uh, but Claude is exactly, he never had, uh, he never had flexible shoulders. So, so he needed to adapt his handstand. So instead of opening his shoulders completely, he opened a little bit his T-spine and lifted his chest and, and still was able to do an efficient straight handstand. And this is a, a method that I, uh, you, uh, whether you, now, now if someone has tight shoulders and tight thoracic spine, then there's no option but doing a banana handstand. Mm. Is that Which right? Is not, yeah, it's not bad for your body. It's still a handstand, but it's, right. not, it's not what we're aiming. We're aiming at the modern straight handstand. Why? If you look, that's the evolution of, of the, the skill. Okay? So, so there's no, you know, uh, you know, you have a contortion, uh, contortion handstand, which is like a, a scorpion handstand, mm -hmm. which is an extreme banana. There's nothing wrong mm. with it. It's just a different, it's a different uh, skill. Mm, it's, it's mm. The handstand, it's a different variation of the handstand, like the difference between a straddle and a tuck. So you have a, a arched or, or a scorpion or a Mexican handstand. It's just different variations. The goal is to be able to do all of them. Uh, if it, but for that, you need to have the mobility to mm. do all, all of the positions. What so, were you so, doing outside practice to get, or what would you recommend for people to get more mobility, say tight shoulders, tight thoracic, any, any I mean, do you do, you, so, personally, so you, do, really, like, you do a lot of wrist stuff, don't you? you I do mean, the, the, the wrist I do it more as, uh, and I teach it in my workshop, it's more of a preparation, but, but the adaptation to handstand should happen while doing handstand. Right. Okay, you don't need to prepare five years in order to do a handstand. You need to start from day one to do a handstand and, Over time, 
adapt to the position, improve your mobility. And of course, you can go to other uh, areas, you know, like you can do uh, improve your hanging ability, be able to do a passive hang is a good test for, for shoulder mobility, being mm-hmm. able to work on your forward bend, being able to do a bridge, being able to do splits. These are all very basic gymnastics. You know, these are, you know, splits, bridge, uh, splits, bridges, and, and, and like maybe taking uh, dis- uh, dislocates with a stick. These are things that 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 are typical for an eight year old mm. gymnast. Mm. You have to you, you you work on these from day one. If you can do a bridge, if you can do a forward bend, you can do a handstand. Mm. If you want to do a, a split in a handstand, you need to do a split. So you need to do, you know you, depending on where you want to take your hand balancing, you'll have other projects to work along um, along your practice. Uh, in my own practice, you know, I, I, obviously, I, I never had to learn these uh, um, ranges, but I still uh, do them every day. I, I usually the way I like to do it, I, you know, I have my warm up, uh, spine mobility that I, you know, change over time. But I usually do a sets of splits, sets of backbends within my practice, using my resting time from handstand to get things done. And and uh, and maintain these ranges mm-hmm. and 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 even improve them over the years to do a I mean, split or you know if 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 you if you, you know you don't really need in life an oversplit but if you want to do a skill that requires an oversplit you <laughs> you have to do it you know so so that's that's where uh, where it comes from but you can do you but you you can do a one arm handstand without a split you don't need to split yeah yeah yeah. Did, did you, I mean, you worked with a lot of yoga people. You, you know, you mm-hmm. had the exposure to yoga. You, yeah. I mean, you say you're doing backbends. Is it a, a yoga? I mean, is it a yoga style backbend? Have you learned anything from the yoga people yeah, I mean, and incorporated I, I, that in your practice? Constantly, like, you know, like, uh, but it's, it's more like a, not so much. I, I never, I, I haven't taken a class. But you know, you, I meet people like like Sophia, like uh, like Rob Lucas from Shanghai. Like uh, I don't know if you know him. Uh, like uh, all these advanced practitioners, you know, in, in your in your uh, Mark Roberts in the workshop, he came a few times to my workshop, and just practicing along them is 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 invaluable. You see how they work on their hamstrings, how they work on their psoas, how they do their, their backbends, how they approach the backbend. Um, it seems like you're and, doing more backbends. I see more backbends on your Instagram I, now. I, you know, so it's, it's a, it's a, it's a long term, you know. Yeah. Yes, but, you know, the, the progress is very slow and it's more about maintaining it, keeping the back back healthy. I'm, I'm you know, yeah, maybe because I compare myself to my daughters, and then, then, then I feel that the progress is uh, very slow. But, but I'm, you know, I, I'm still... Back. I'm still learning and, and yeah. making sure like the forward bend and, uh, you know, I had in the past also, I had like a, uh, what you want to show a back bend? Yeah. You sure? If you want, you can show <laughs> I, my daughter, Omi, she's a rhythmic gymnast. So she also does a little handstand, but a lot of back bends. She's a natural. You want to show her? You want to show? So uh, later on, if you want to show, uh, I mean, any time. Yeah, yeah. She's going to warm up a little bit. Uh, for example, uh, you know, the, there's skills like the figa in the, the one arm, you know, so, so it's a combination. You need a, a, a flexible thoracic spine. You need to uh, flexible and healthy shoulders. You need a spinal twist as well and a pike position. So, so it's, it's a, it involves a lot. People who have this flexibility naturally, whether it's yogis or natural then they can access this skill. People who don't have one of these just cannot do the skill. Okay, so, so, so that's where yoga can, can be very valuable uh, as a practitioner. So, so I more, uh, I, I take over the years through my acquaintance and, and mm-hmm. different yoga practitioners uh, or, or today even from social media. There's a lot going on mm-hmm. there. If you look at the right people, if you listen to the, you know, you can take and apply uh, certain. Uh, and you do that on your own. I mean, you're techniques. doing it on your own because you've got the background. But would you yeah. recommend that other people have a look and to the, oh, let's have a I, go I at just, that? 
Just, just like, just like I, I, uh, if people ask me what the first thing you would recommend for a hand balancer is go study with a hand, hand handstand teacher mm-hmm. or hand, a handstand practitioner, not necessarily me. In general, you're going to save a lot of time. Someone who Ooh, yeah. actually yeah. does it. Okay. And in the flexibility wise, go study with people who that's what they, whether it's stretching uh, specialists or yoga practitioners who have been doing it all their life and have exper- experienced injuries and have seen it, other people getting injured and learn from their mistakes. Okay. So, so I, I, you know, I give I share my approach, but I don't teach it in my workshops. You know, I teach things that are relevant to the handstand mm. and, mm. and, mm. and uh, people can see me practice and then learn from that as well. But, but it's not like, uh, okay, I, I don't, uh, you know, I'm not going to teach someone a back bend because that's something I'm still learning. On right. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you incorporate, and I, I see you're doing a lot of headstands now. Yeah, this is something, uh, so, so um, the first time I met Claude, uh, he introduced me to head balancing. For him, it's the same. It's balance. It's head balance and handstand go, go together. But when I met him, I was like, uh, well, you know, I told him I'm 32, you know, I'm getting old. I don't want to risk my neck and da, 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 da. And he said, okay, don't worry about it. And I, and I just, I, I left it. You know, I tried it, but it didn't feel comfortable on the neck. Uh, and then uh, when, I, uh, when I moved to Europe, I was 41. And I, and I said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to give it a try. And a friend of mine, another Yuval Oz from Israel, he, he made his own uh, headpiece, you know, kind of like a cork mm. made around the uh, thing that stabilizes your head. Um, and I, and I, I took it as a project. So uh, my goal was in one year to hold for a minute. And I, and I, I, headstand. I headstand without the hands. Oh, okay. Right. So we're not just talking about doing a regular headstand or tripod. No, no, no. I'm, no, I'm okay. talking about. No, no, I was you have going to just for the, balance on the head yeah, on its own. Okay. Right, okay. Well, it's yeah. good to clarify because you're kind of talking about headstand. I think, well, if you can stand your hands, you can do a regular headstand. No, no. So, so, so I, used, head, I, I used, I used, I used also from, from my acquaintance with yoga and I, I used the basic technique to, to get a, a custom to the pressure on the neck. Uh, you know, basic yoga positions, uh, you know, classic. And, and, and so I use it as a warm up regular handstand. Uh, of course, there's some technique that are a little different, but the basic uh, is the same. And, and then I, you know, I took it as a project and, 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 and learned it on my own with some help of, of some other practitioners. I also went to other advanced practitioners to receive mm. some uh, feedback. And they gave, me, they gave me some valuable information. And also then later on when I when I went to Claude, he also gave me some more feedback. Mm. You know, it's more about little little thing. No, you need to take your hip that direction and to relax your pelvis and relax your belly and and you know. So so it's it's you know kind of the tricks of the tricks of the trade. You you have to learn it by someone who does it. Mm. And mm. then and then the approach I took it. You know, I started by you know five minutes a day, uh, sets of one minute. With uh, and I took ten minutes rest in between sets. Oh, just five. on the head, nothing else. Just, just yeah. So, head. so, so I Without did. Uh, so, so how I did it, and how I also still do today, because I wasn't young when I like, and you have one neck, and I, I was really like, okay, I need to be responsible for it, for it, and make sure that I don't have any issues with my neck. Um. So, so I, I experimented with this, and and. The, how I do it until today also. Um, today I do my, my average set on my head is two minutes, two to three minutes. And, and I, I, every set of headstand, I do three sets of handstand in between. Right. So, so give me about 10 minutes between sets. So it's, it's, a, it's enough time for the neck uh, to, to rest. And then you still use the time to develop your, your handstand. So it's very, it's like time efficient and, and basically over time adapt to, to, to this uh, similar, but different skill. Um, and, uh, and, and similar to the handstand focus on, uh, and it's even more than the handstand 
the, the, the need to be uh, effortless while doing handstand. The correct technique, it's effortless. Right. Nothing, there's no body tension at all except the neck that's elongated, but the rest of the body is like floating in the water. And, and this is a sensation in hand, bal- hand, hand balance, head balancing as opposed right. to handstand, which is more uh, controlled and rigid. And requires so finally, the, the end of technique is is no effort. It sounds a bit. Yeah. It sounds a bit. You've been um, listening to too many yogis. Um, <laughs> no, but, but this is. But this is. You know, this is from yeah. Claude, but also, but also Absolutely. just from, from experience. Yeah. If if mm-hmm. you want, if you want to stay in a, a certain like, a, if you stay for in a shirshasana in a headstand for five minutes, you have to do a good position. If you, if you are pike too much and you're yeah. The, yeah. the stress is going to be too much on your neck and your back. So you Let's need live. to align, align your hips, center of mass over the base of support in order for you to relax your, your lower back and your, your core or whatever. Okay, so, so this is the same principle. What about the breathing? We're gonna, let's go back to the breathing again. Is there any so, specific so bre- aspect? Uh, bre- yeah. mm-hmm. So first thing is breathe. Typical mistake of, of the hand balancers uh, or people who learn is that they because they in, in their mind they have this okay it's a it's a, a strength skill and they hold their breath so that's the first the you know typical mistake that people are holding their breath while doing uh, handstand so so the so the first comment is first of all you need to breathe all the time there's no holding of the breath and and the, the breath usually you breathe from your nose if you if it's clear. And it's very light and shallow, effortless breaths from the, from the breath. Be- yeah, right. from the belly, from the, from the belly. So you don't you don't fill up your your chest cavity with you know you don't fill up your lungs mm-hmm. so much mm-hmm. like it's it, this doesn't move and it's just uh, the the belly is is uh, is working there very lightly. You you still uh, relax in this area. So so mm. this is this is the typical. Uh, mm, mm, uh, hand mm. hand balancing. Uh, yeah. You know, mm. sometimes I have you know yogis in in my my class that get confused mm. and they start doing the ujjayi breathing and you like you see the, you know someone doing handstand and the whole room is shaking. You know, it's like okay, okay, okay. This there's time to do that and there's time to do that. When doing the typical handstand, you need to just uh, right. re- relax and and make it seem like you're not breathing almost. Yeah. What about the um there's different um, different thoughts about the press, right? So you're pressing to a handstand. I've uh, taught it to people over the years. I've always done it on the exhale. But then I think Guillermo told me that he'd been told to do it on the inhale. Um, I, I really... Many, uh, is I, I, there any this, benefit I don't, of I don't, harnessing the breath? And we have this technique in yoga called kind of, kind of Tristana, which means the breath and the bandha, and maybe also the head position in the drishti and the gazing. You know, a, a, a press, when done correctly, is so easy, okay? It's not even requires uh, like a drama right. or, you know, okay. I can, you know, once you do, if you are very flexible and you have some good, some strength, you have a handstand, which is enough strength, you can do multiple presses without, uh, it's not a big deal, okay? And, and for yogis, those who are like, uh, when I was working with uh, Mark or Sophia, they're so flexible and, and they're also strong and, and, and it's very easy for them to learn, learn the skill. You know, if you compress, if you're able to do a, a good forward bend, you don't need to lean much forward. It requires a lot much, a lot less shoulder strength. Now, people who, like if I go to a CrossFit and they have no forward bend, they will need to develop a full-on plunge in order to do just the press. It's possible, but it's mm. a lot more stra- uh, a, a lot more strength involved. Right. Okay? So mm. I don't, uh, you know, I obviously uh, all, all the sequences, all the presses, I continuously breathe. So more flexibility, less strength needed. Yes, and the combination as a combination is the best. That's how you when you see yeah. world world class uh, gymnast, for example. It's a good example. They are the, some of the strongest people I know, and they're the ranges are optimal, perfect forward bend, good back bend, and, and the rest is just technique. Mm. If you're Let able to... Com- of, com- 
balancing the two, the strength and flexibility yeah. balance. Mm. So, so a lot of like a lot, a lot of yogis. Uh, that's what their uh, weakness. The we, the weakness is the weakness. So they need yeah. to invest some time to develop, you know, a plunge, which is a good one to uh, that's relevant also for yoga, uh, a tuck plunge at least. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, L sit or press on L sit or or and 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 the method I I always use and is very powerful is to learn uh, in reverse so do do the negative start in handstand right. mm. for this you need for this you need a handstand so i i don't usually i don't teach a press before the practitioner can hold solid handstand mm. i don't teach a press in order to do a handstand i do a handstand and then that will allow them to express themselves other ways with, with a press yeah okay yeah. For the press, I'll, I'll, I'll teach the mounts that using dynamic, you know, using the strength of the legs or a little hop to, to do a straddle press or a pike press or a tuck press, which is basically is the same root of, of the press, except that it doesn't require any strength because you use your legs to create momentum. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and all, all, all of this, how important is the neck? The neck position. I mean, you mentioned it a bit before. It's, it's, it's um, a very uh, critical mm-hmm. one. Um, mm. The neck, although extended, it should be completely relaxed. Right. So, so, so this is you know, there's a, 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 the neck positioning is very specific. I teach it in my, in my workshop. Tension in the neck when, when doing uh, when doing handstand. Should and be you completely, work, completely you work relaxed. Off, you can, you could kind of you could take people in the workshops from beginner to advanced. I mean, people can come to the workshop as a beginner. Yeah, yeah. There are there are yeah. people who I met as beginners, and over the year they came to my my intermediate workshops. Right. But it's not something like uh, I, I I they come for a weekend and I do six hours of handstand. You don't learn a handstand in six hours. You need to put uh, two hundred hours in practice afterwards. So mm-hmm. what I try to to do in the workshop is okay. This is how you should practice. So if if you are if you decide you want to go that path and are committed to do this high uh, volume of repetition, because that's how that's the name of the game. It's repetition, mm-hmm. a lot of repetition. But if you would, uh, repeat in a wrong technique, you're perpetuating a mistake, which is you can you can it can take you a step back. Or, right. or make the process longer than it should. Mm. So, so when people come to my workshop or other workshops for that matter with advanced practitioners, they shorten the process. It's still going to be a lot of work. And the, the higher level you go, the more work you need to put into it. It's always going to be a lot of work, but it will uh, shorten the, the time mm. needed to, to achieve what you were aiming for. So, so this is, uh, yeah... The, this is what, what I basically I do in the workshop. Kind of clarify. Just wanted to ask, to this. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wanted to ask you a couple more questions before we finish um, that people yeah. are always interested in. How do you recover from injuries? I mean, you've had a number of injuries. Uh, oftentimes when I'm teaching and people have an injury, they say, well, I'm going to rest completely. I ought to rest completely for a while. Uh, let it heal and come back to it. I mean, what, what's been your experience with the kind of rest or, or kind of work through it? Uh, no, I mean, I'm, I'm a proponent of, you know, you always, you have to do something. I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not going to sit down for six months. So that's, but that said, uh, if, if, if you, uh, if you have a wrist injury or a shoulder injury, you don't work with pain. So you find uh, the ranges that allow you to, uh, to do the skill without pain, without Significant the bad pain, okay, and then over time ad- we adapt to the skill that you're trying to acquire. Mm. Okay, so um, you know when I'm injured to a certain point that you know I'm not talking about nagging pains or inflammation that that, that I know from my experience how to deal with. Uh, I, I usually, but I usually am very active in my rehab. You know, yeah. so I'll do high, vo- like if I'm injured, I'll do a high volume of very low intensity, you know, mo- mo- movement of the joint rather than just let it completely rest. 
I don't, right. I don't believe in that. Um, right. And I mm-hmm. go to professionals. You know, I I, I, I have people that uh, um, you know that help me in, in in rehabbing. I'm not, you know, sometimes I, I push myself. Uh, too much, and I feel some pain in my shoulders. So, so I'll, I'll reduce the the volume or reduce the the skills that require focus on other things. You right. know, mm. work on my flexibility and, and do less hands and on what I normally do. But I'll still I always do, I always think always think something. Yeah, yeah. You know, work on your back bend, work on your flexibility. Mm. If if your shoulders mm. hurts, you can do so many other things that will still be valuable once you go back to normal. And, mm. and this is something that I think every practitioner uh, needs to learn, you know, learn from their mistakes and learn what works for them. And over the years also it changes, you know, like uh, rehabbing from an injury when you're 20 is very different than when you're 50. And the consequences of an injury when you're 50 are you know, it's much more complicated. So you have to be careful with the choices you make also uh, with the skills you do. So a 50-year-old need to do like backbending in a high level mm. and continue to do it. Or at some point you said, okay, I don't need to compete with anyone. I don't need to go that far. I can maintain a certain level of a healthy range. You know, the, and it, and it happens with the hand bouncing. You see the videos, you're competing with people in Cirque du Soleil. How do you, you know, you, at certain point, you need to know where, where to you know, choose mm. the battles and, 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 and where, where to focus your, your energy. So kind of, and, yeah, and, it's also a kind of emotional, psychological, isn't it, in a way? To, yeah. yeah, to pick your to, battles to let and go. to know. To let go. Yeah, when, to when let enough go. is enough. Um, Oh, just one last question. Everyone's always interested in diet. Obviously, you're training a lot and you always have. Do you have any recommendations for diet? What does your kind of food look like? I, I you know, I, I'd say a cliche. I eat healthy. You know, I don't eat junk food. Um, Are you a vegetarian? I, yeah. No. No, I'm not no. vegetarian. Yeah. Do you, do you think you ought to be a vegetarian for a high-class training? I mean, is that possible? It's possible. You know, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know some high level uh, hand bouncers that are vegan. So right, it's right. definitely po- possible. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. It's it's more of a, you know, it's a different discussion. It's not, not so much uh, about the health. It's an ethical discussion, but, uh, uh, you know. You can get enough protein possible. to build the body with, uh, with a vegan diet. I believe so. You, you, I, have, I can say, you know, you there are examples. It. You've seen it. But, I, you know, th- then it gets, it's personal. Some people fit certain diets and some people don't. And you've seen that as well, have you? Yeah, I've seen, you know, yeah. I've seen paleo and I've seen vegans and I've seen uh, thing and, and people uh, experiment with different, uh, mm-hmm. what's, what's for, I think uh, the, the main, uh, as far as diet is a uh, practitioner, is an athlete. Is uh, is what you eat uh, um, allows you to show up to practice and do the work. If if you have the energy to do it, if you are developing strength, if you are you know, and, and then and then ad- adapt your your diet accordingly. If mm. if you if you don't have the energy to practice physically, then then something is wrong. Right. Okay. So, so you, so, so over the years, I was, I was, I've been able to, to maintain, you know, uh, you know, what I, uh, I want. Well, do you train? Do you train on an empty stomach, or I mean, do you, do you eat later, or how does it look your actual diet? You know, like I, I can eat. I can, you know, like, uh, example during vacations, uh, I with my family. So I, I practice early in the morning from six thirty to eight thirty or nine. So I do it on empty stomach, but usually, you know, I take my girls to school, come back, have another coffee, second coffee after breakfast, and then I practice. So, you know, if I feel, what's important that you come to practice and you're comfortable and then, and then later, you know, eat, and uh, usually I eat uh, bigger more in the evening, but, uh, um, but I, I adapt to my, my practice. Mm. And I try to be flexible with it. I, I can practice in the morning. I can practice in the evening. Right. Or midnight, if I need. You know, usually I have my routine. But is that flexibility, do you think a routine is useful or, or is it useful to be flexible? Were you always flexible? Because, I mean, another thing is that 
people in this right, you know, get very I, rigid and you know and very obsessed with it you know and, and did, you have you to, had that I, I, i'm kind of like a, it's a, uh i'm interested in the long run uh, when you have your life you have your family you have your you know mm. you have to adapt to the reality so so <laughs> if i want to do it for 30 more years i need to figure out a way to to do other things and still feel that I'm progressing and learn mm. and maybe change. I, you know, over the years, I changed a little bit, whether it's diet, whether it's technique, how I train, how I deal with injuries, uh, respecting my age as I go. You know, um, I have enough time now. I've been doing hand balancing specifically almost for, um, I mean, I'm doing Hanson as a gymnast for 40 years, but uh, I started like hand balancing in, in, in 2000 and. Mm. Four. Mm. So close, soon it's going to be, um, you know, 20 years of specifically of handstand. Mm. I'm 20 years older also. So, so it's going to be, and I'm sure it's going to change over time, whether it's uh, injuries or whether it's just acceptance of, of there are certain th- things that, that you need to learn how to let, let go and, and focus on other things that are perhaps less dependent on strength and physicality and, and, uh, and more on, on understanding the movement or the technique itself. So, so this and you're is, okay with that process. You're okay with that flexibility and kind of letting go and acceptance or is that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That? I'm, I'm still, I'm still, uh, inspired and by what I see, you right. know, you see a lot today and, and at the same time, I'm like, as long as I'm learning a new skill every year, then, then it, it fulfills this, thing because I, you know, I'm better than what I was before, maybe not stronger, but I'm doing things that I've never done before. This is, for example, why the head balancing was very fresh uh, addition to my practice. It's completely like now it's part of my daily routine and, and, and I'm learning new things every month, every year, new tricks, new understanding, new level of control, which is, which is what keeps you going. You need to, uh, be excited about it. Be excited to practice. And mm. this is like fi- finish mm. with one of my, uh, one of my, one of the thing that my, one of my coaches when I was a kid used to, you know, I, I used to do, a, I used to be a worker. And even in the weekend, I used to train that, that you need to rest one day on the Shabbat and the Shabbat, whatever, in the weekend, yeah. you need to rest completely. So you come back on, on Sunday or Monday, excited and fresh to yeah. go to, to so you know, to, fi- to learn final, a new skill. Final question then. What do you do when yeah. you relax? What, what kind of stuff do you do for fun? Um, yeah. You know, this is fun for me. <laughs> you know, that and so, so, you know, normal stuff. Uh, you know, I'm a father also. So, you know, there's always stuff with the family. You know, the, net, the occasional Netflix and uh, I read and I juggle yeah. and, you know, uh, I like, I like physical stuff, but, uh, mm. but because I'm, I do so much in the Hanson though, sometimes I just need to relax. relax literally. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, it was wonderful talking to you. I really enjoyed it. And I hope well. I enjoy yeah. it too. Okay. Um, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much for your